In this episode of Between the Lines, IDS researcher Ian Schoons talks about his book, Sustainable Livelihoods and Rural Development. It's part of a series of small books for big ideas. The book looks at the role of social institutions and the politics of policy, as well as issues of identity, gender and generation. Ian argues that livelihoods approaches can provide a key lens to addressing challenges of poverty, inequality and environment and a useful framework for implementing the Sustainable Development Goals. Interviewing Ian is IDS researcher Marina Apgar. Ian, now you've spent over 30 years working on land, livelihoods and agrarian and environmental change in, in Africa. And in 1998... You wrote the IDS working paper on sustainable rural livelihoods. And I remember actually reading it back in 98, 99, as a a young development practitioner going out to the field and being very inspired by the fact that it started to help illustrate how rural livelihoods are integrated and, and, and interrelated and so the, the, the framework that was part of that paper, the now very famous and much used and perhaps abused as well <laughs> framework in that paper. And as you explain in the introduction of your book, the influential paper built on earlier work advocating for a livelihoods approach in rural development. And so you've returned to this theme. Tell us what has motivated you to come back to this and write this book now. Well, thanks for the invitation. And yes, the uh, original paper that uh, you mentioned did have a lot of make a lot of waves, um, and indeed was used and and indeed abused. And it took me a long time to come back to this debate. But twenty years after that paper was produced, there were a number of events uh, held, and I was asked, as others were asked, uh, to reflect on where the livelihoods approach had got to. And it was interesting because 20 years on, a lot of the discussions we'd had back then had disappeared from the the general discussions of development. And the original motivation for livelihoods approaches, which, as you mentioned, go way before 1998, I mean, go back to colonial era studies of different places in in Africa, India and elsewhere, uh, were attempts to try and join the dots, link Mm. up different perspectives, different understandings of how people make a living in rural areas. And they weren't stuck in disciplinary or sectoral approaches. They were a real attempt to have a holistic, integrated understanding. And in the mid-90s, we were invited by... um, It was actually before DFID, the Department for International Development, but we got a grant from the British government to look at uh, livelihoods in Bangladesh, in Mali, and in Ethiopia. And one of the things that we did back then was think, well, how do we get a team to work on what's happening in, in these places? I mean, that was the basic question. How do people make a living? Who's doing better? Who's doing worse? What are the changes that are happening in these settings? And that framework that you mentioned emerged out of those discussions. And it was a discussion between economists, anthropologists, geographers, natural scientists working on the technical aspects of agronomy and livestock production and so on. And it was a a genuine attempt to try and think, well, if there are different contexts in places, what are the resources people make use of? How do those result in different livelihood strategies and what are the outcomes? And in the um, framework that we developed back then, uh, there was a big emphasis on institutions, institutions and policies as mediating people's possibilities of different livelihoods. That was often dropped in the subsequent applications of the livelihood framework, but Coming back to it, as I said, 20 years on, and now even more years on, the basic argument, I think, is still just as relevant, but still rather under-emphasised both in development thinking, because we're, we get stuck in disciplinary silos, and development practice, because get, we get stuck in sectoral silos. Mm. 
So an attempt to sort of revive the debate and come back to it was an important motivation for me and indeed was the, was the driving force of, uh, of developing the arguments in the book. Yes, exactly. As you say, this ability to look across silos and, and to look at how complex people's livelihoods are is what I think is, is sort of at the root of, of the livelihoods approach that is still relevant today. And I think one of the things you do in the book also is that you, for those of us who are comfortable with that sort of deep knowledge of context, right, as, as the starting point, you then also push us to think about the macro and to think about those interactions, as well as both the empirical and the theoretical. So why is that bringing of those together so relevant, you think, in today's development context? Well, one of the, the things that I tried to do in the book, which is different to what the earlier livelihood discussions centred on, was to bring in, as you say, these broader questions of, of politics and, and more generally political economy. Because I think, quite rightly, there were a lot of critiques of the earlier approaches. It was very micro, it was very localist, it was all about what was happening in a, in a very particular place. But I think, you know, one of the very pertinent critiques of, of that, that earlier livelihoods work was, well, what, what do changing economic relations at a global level, processes of economic globalization and so on, how do they impinge on what happens at, at a local level? So that was a real motivation for, for extending the livelihoods framework and asking questions that go, went beyond the, the very particular questions of who has assets and who, who do, which livelihood strategies are pursued and, and which outcomes uh, happen in particular places. And I think by connecting debates that, again, have a long, long history in critical agrarian political economy, for example, we can connect two strands of discussion which actually haven't really been very well connected bizarrely, because they're both concentrated and focused on questions of, of who wins and who loses in rural areas. The livelihoods approach is, is quite descriptive, it's quite detailed, it's, it's cross-sectoral and cross-disciplinary, as we say. But a political economy approach asks some other more pertinent questions, I think. And in the book, I borrow from actually the, the, an earlier book in the series, the first book in the series, by um, Henry Bernstein, who does a fantastic job in his book of explaining some of the big issues in, in critical agrarian political economy. And that helped me think, OK, this isn't too dissimilar from some of the questions we'd want to ask in, in a livelihoods approach. And there's a very nice bit in, in Henry's book where he asks a series, of, a series of questions which I think help us push... The, the livelihoods approach beyond its its descriptive um, approach from before, and those questions I, th I mean I can I can just repeat them here because I think they they're helpful for anyone thinking about livelihoods. I mean the first question is is basically who owns what or indeed who has access to what to what and that's about property and ownership and assets and resources already part of the livelihoods approach, but also asking more analytically about the politics of access. The second question is, who does what? Well, that's a question of, of livelihood activities, but also, crucially, social, gender, divisions of labour, who's a worker, who's not, who's working for whom, and so on, and who's an employer. Who gets what? Well, that's questions of, of income and assets, but crucially drawing from political economy, questions of accumulation. Who is able to uh, get more and invest more and through what means? And uh, I distinguish in the book, following many others, uh, accumulation from below, where, for example, small-scale farmers are making a profit and investing in their land, and accumulation from above. And then... The fourth question Henry asks is, what do they do with it? Well, that's the livelihood strategy, but questions of the relationships between consumption and social reproduction and investments and savings. And we added two more questions in a debate that we were having um, in a group uh, concerned with, with land grabbing and land investment. 
because we felt that these these questions needed to be added to by asking questions about uh, relationships in society, relationships between social classes and and with the state, and that's centrally about who how processes of, of social and political change happen, and crucially because I come from a tradition of working on environment, introducing environmental questions, political ecological questions about the relationship between um, politics and ecology. So those six questions together, I think, provide us with a a route in to asking Mm. some very concrete and analytical questions that move the the livelihood uh, framework onwards. And in the book, uh, there are a number of different examples from from India, from China, from uh, Ecuador and so on. But I personally use this approach very much in my work that's been going on for, well, you mentioned some of the length of time that I've been working in this field earlier on, embarrassingly long time, Mm -hmm. in Zimbabwe, where I have indeed been working for over 30 years in a a number of different places. And what I think this uh, extended uh, livelihoods framework helps us do is understand longitudinal change. So Mm -hmm. if we ask those six questions in the settings that I've been working in in Zimbabwe, we can see how livelihoods approaches change, how patterns of accumulation change, who's winning, who's losing, basically how people are making a living um, and who's doing better and who's doing worse. But asking this in a much more analytical way that links to an understanding of political economy. And of course, I've been studying issues of land reform and the consequences of land reform since 2000 in Zimbabwe. And of course, There's, not surprisingly, a lot of questions of political economy, institutions, politics, who gains access to what resources, through what means, uh, centrally part of the story. So it's not just collecting data, for example, Mm. on how many crops are grown and what's the output of the crop and how many assets do people hold. That's the descriptive element, which, you know, good, solid agricultural economics does very well. But I think we have to ask these other questions in addition. And I found this... Having returned to this debate after all those years and connecting it with discussions in in agrarian political economy, very productive. So I hope other readers find it too. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So this you've been talking about how you recapture and, and reinvigorate these political dimensions that were originally in the framework, uh, but perhaps got lost in in how it was uh, put into use. And we see that, I mean, as you know, I work a lot around complexity and and sort of that helps us see some of the similar, I think, questions. And holding on, however, to the nuance, the relational, the complex, the messy, the the ambiguous, which is what indeed the politics and power aspects of these these questions and these processes of change are, are often about, is what becomes quite difficult in practice. And particularly for decision makers and those out there sort of doing development, if you like. So what I think you also do in the book, which kind of moves beyond remembering these lenses that, are, that, that might have been forgotten, is that you also talk about, alongside the right questions, um, having an appropriate mix of methods. So the broadening out, actually, how we go about understanding these, these complex processes of change qualitative, quantitative, looking at the micro, at the macro, etc. But then perhaps the most important bit of all is that you then say you have to be reflexive and you have to think about your bias. And that's moving, as you say, from the kind of analysis and understanding into actually being able to operationalize the approach. So who who do you think needs to read the book um, in order to take that step and and what does that mean to them today in this sort of era of SDGs and um, and, and sort of global change processes? Well, uh, yeah, the, the list of potential uh, readers is long. Uh, th- this uh, this book this book series, indeed, there are there are quite a few books in the series now, and they're being translated into lots of different languages, which I'm really delighted about. Um, this particular one's available in in Japanese and Spanish, and it's being translated into, China, into Chinese and a number of other uh, European languages. It w- was really for for students and practitioners. I mean, that's its original audience. Mm-hmm. The, the the sort of tagline for the book series is is small books for big ideas. 
um, by far the most difficult book I've ever written. I've written quite a few um, because the spec was it had to be accessible, it had to be short, it had to cover everything and it had to be interesting and engaging. So, I mean, readers can judge whether that's the case. But it's been an attempt to try and distill this debate and indeed move it on. And I think moving it on uh, for a wider audience, as you say, in this area of SDGs is crucial. Mm. So the SDGs, as you know, were launched with great fanfare in 2015, in fact, the same, um, same time the book was actually originally published, uh, with slightly less fanfare. But the it's quite intriguing to see how the SDGs have evolved since then. Mm. Uh, it's not surprising, but it, it's why this book becomes particularly relevant. Because the SDGs, as you know, there are 17 goals and goodness knows how many indicators and, mm -hmm. and, and so on associated with them, um, were originally conceived as something about being integrated, about a, a joint project for humanity, and so on and so forth. And rather like the fate of the original livelihoods framework, as it got absorbed into development agencies, and it was, you know, the original one was taken up by not only the British government's aid agency, but also FAO and NGOs of all shapes and sizes, it got instrumentalised and sort of pulled apart. You know, the, the framework had its pentagon and its you know, and its checklist and the consultants got on board and ran training programs to deliver it, um, which which is what made me depressed about it for probably that period of 20 years. But the SDGs have suffered a similar fate mm. because rather than seeing them as a sort of integrated progressive goal, leave no one behind, integrate justice with environment mm. and development... People have seen them, oh, well, that's my goal, that's my goal, oh, how do we implement this goal? Or at the most, combining a couple of goals, and we can do water and women, for example. But it misses almost the, the whole point of mm. the goals. Now, my argument, I've just written a short paper for one of the UNDP publications, who's obviously lead in the UN SDGs, is actually the livelihoods approaches are sitting there, ready for thinking about implementing the SDGs. They're integrated, there's analytical framework, there's a, an approach that, as you say, links pertinent and analytical questions that are political or have political dimensions to them with practical methods, and let's do it. Thinking about, uh, in a livelihoods approach type of way, about implementing the SDGs, and it doesn't have to be rural. I mean, my book focuses on the rural dimension, but it could be, in, could be in Brighton, it could be in Delhi, it could be in rural Zimbabwe. The same broad questions apply. So if we want to uh, address the dual challenges of poverty and inequality as well as environment and uh, injustice, then we have to think in that integrated way. And sometimes it's quite useful to look back Mm -hmm. and learn from experience in the past because actually reinventing the wheel from scratch is mm -hmm. often a little bit tiring and sometimes there are some good ideas there it can be repurposed for the con contemporary era but um so all all the people out there thinking about the SDGs and their implementation wherever you are um you can have a look at the book and see if whether, whether this is a framework for for mm. moving the SDGs from the sort of rhetorical step to something that's practical and, and implementable on the ground, but, but not suffering the same fate of the mm. earlier livelihoods approaches of instrumentalising it and just it becoming a sort of formulaic ritual for spending money rather than thinking about transformatory change. Yes, absolutely. I mean, towards the end of the book, you, you have a bit of a, a call for action, don't you? Which is sort of along the lines of what you were just talking about. And this linking from the, the, the sort of the, the right questions and the analytical and the thinking into moving into the, the, the doing and, and back to that thing about being, being reflexive. So I guess one last question would be, so as you, as you looked back and you, and, and you thought about uh, what was originally there and, and, and 
brought it to light in, in today's context. What was the most surprising thing or what did you learn from doing that? I learned a lot, actually. Um, but I think the most exciting part of doing the book was to try and make that link, which I think is central to it and central to the series as a whole, between livelihood thinking coming out of development studies and sort of a broad sort of um, understanding of, of development questions with, as I said before, agrarian political economy. And I went back even before the 1940s, back to Karl Marx's uh, book, The Grundrisse. He didn't write it as a book, he wrote it as a series of notebooks that only got published much later, but originally written in 19, 1858. And he wrote in the introduction a really interesting piece about method in political economy. And very often we think of, of Marx only in relation to the sort of broad understanding of, of structural relations and, and sort of big political economy, capital P, capital E. But his understanding of what political economy meant in, as a method was very much, in his words, thinking about the multiple determinations and relations in society that I would call a livelihoods analysis, a sort of micro-understanding of the particularities of what people do and how people do it, and what he calls the concrete, the wider structural relations that affect what people do and what people can and can't do, who can accumulate, who can't, who gets rich, who doesn't, who becomes a capitalist, who ends mm. up only as a, a, as a tenant farmer or a worker or whatever. So the concrete is about class relations and structural relations that affect how people can and can't live. So his argument is that method in political economy needs both, and it has a, requires a constant iteration between the two. Well, that's basically the argument for a livelihoods approach, or at least a politically informed livelihoods approach. So I found that a rather useful way in to say, OK, well, there's a whole tradition of, of political economy that's emerged out of the writings of Marx and many others. How do we connect that? And it's sometimes a little bit shocking in development studies that we don't go back to some of the sort of classic thinking. And I think that then becomes important. So there aren't, I, you know, anyone listening, don't worry, there's not huge tracts of, of Marx in the book. But there are inspirations that are coming from that type of thinking. And I thought that that was surpri surprising, partly because I hadn't read it for years and years and years, mm -hmm. but useful in a very contemporary setting. Um, so I think that connection of relating uh, the micro, the detailed, is what you started with, with at the beginning, and the macro and the structural, and thinking about those together... Mm -hmm is essential for any of our analyses. And very often we don't have necessarily the capacities to, to bridge those. So it either has to be done um, in teams with different people looking at different things or with this vision of, of complexity and holistic analysis and so on that allows those connections to, to happen. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I don't know about you, but I certainly learned a lot from Ian's concise and yet comprehensive interview. If you want to find out more, follow the links in the episode description. And if you're enjoying this podcast, we'd really appreciate you to take a couple of moments to rate and review it on iTunes, and please share it with your friends and colleagues. Get in touch with us if you have any comments or any suggestions for future episodes by emailing between the lines at ids.ac.uk.